about all of the spiritual disciplines we are called to practice, there is one that I find more difficult than any other. It's not fasting. It's not working towards the biblical tithe or confession or caring for those on the margins of society. What I find harder than anything else is forgiveness. I find it far easier to lean into the human tendency to hold grudges, to build walls to ensure permanent separation, to seek retaliation instead of practicing forgiveness. I can, I can even wax poetic about the theological importance of forgiveness. But truth be told, I'd much rather keep it as a sort of do as I say, not as I do sort of thing. Because forgiveness is just plain hard. So I want to share with you a story from my own life. For the first time, I truly understood why forgiveness is such an important spiritual practice. A few years ago, I find myself in a situation where I was physically assaulted. Someone with a whole lot of anger decided to take it out on me. Long after the physical injuries had been healed, I was left with spiritual wounds that still needed attention. I spent months talking this through with my therapist, exploring the varieties of emotions I was experiencing. No matter how much I talked about it, I felt like I was just stewing, which, just like you do when something simmers on the stove, only intensified my feelings. So when she thought the moment was right, my therapist asked me if I had considered forgiving my attacker. Now, when she asked that question, I'll be honest, I wasn't only mad at him, now I was really mad at her, too. Forgive? How could she suggest such a ludicrous thing? After expressing this to her in terms that were less than calm and gentle, I began to recognize that her question touched the deep nerve. I was worried. That if I let go of my anger and forgave, somehow that would excuse his behavior. And as I became honest with my fear of forgiveness, I started to realize that she was onto something. But still not willing to completely give up my anti-forgiveness position, I asked her why. Why should I forgive? She said to me, by refusing to forgive, you're only harming yourself. You've allowed your soul to be consumed with rage, and it's crushing your spirit. But most importantly, you need to forgive because your anger has placed a barrier between you and God. As much as I hated to admit it, she was right. From that moment on, I've had to work on forgiving this man, not for his benefit, but for mine. And that forgiveness has set me free from that anger and has allowed healing to take place. And as that process has continued, I began to recognize that God was working through my pain, that God was in my brokenness, turning darkness to light. I say all this to you not for some sort of pity or to put myself up on some forgiveness pedestal, but to say that I get just how hard, how deep you have to reach for true forgiveness. I think it's that forgiveness, that depth, of emotional exploration that's displayed in the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is one that has captured our popular culture, has captured the minds and imaginations of the world around us. Clearly, there is something to this story because they made a musical out of it. They don't just make musicals out of anything. Though, after re-watching Shrek recently, I am positive a character called Donk is straight out of the book of numbers. <laughs> but I digress. The section we hear today comes towards the end of Joseph's story. It's after the suffering, abandonment, false accusation, and years of imprisonment. Joseph has every reason to be angry with his brothers. They were so jealous of him and the relationship he had with his father that they contemplated killing him. That's a, a bit of an extreme form of sibling rivalry. In the end, they don't decide to kill him. But instead, they sell him off into slavery. After years of not seeing his siblings, after Joseph's ascension from prison to lord over all of Egypt, Joseph finds himself in a position of power over his siblings. His siblings have no idea who he is. 
But when he sees his brothers, he knows exactly who they are. And at first, Joseph's anger and that human inclination for retribution take over. Joseph accuses them of being spies and throws them into jail. And through a variety of events, and if you want to know the details, I hope you'll go home and read Genesis chapters 42 and 43. Joseph arrives at forgiveness. Upon seeing his youngest brother, he's overcome with emotion. He is moved to tears and has a conversion from anger to love. That brings us to today's point in the story. And finally, Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers. In opening his heart to forgiveness and letting go of his anger, Joseph is able to see how God has transformed the sinful, harmful actions of his brothers into actions that bring life and restoration to their family. After revealing his true identity to them, Joseph says to his brothers, Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph doesn't only reveal his identity to his brothers, he also reveals something about the identity of God. Now let me be clear about one very important fact in this story. God does not cause suffering. God did not cause Joseph's brothers to sell him off, resulting in years of anguish and torment. But what God does for Joseph, it's what God always does and what God will always do. God takes what has been broken by human sin and redeems it. God works through the storms, through the pain, to bring restoration and new life. It's something we hear time and time again throughout Scripture. We hear of that great reversal. We hear about God recreating the entirety of creation and what God had dreamed of from the beginning. We hear about God restoring the people of Israel after the exile. We hear about God restoring Joseph and his family. We hear about God restoring us, gathering us up, lavishing us with abundant love, healing us, sending us forth, and waiting to gather us up once again. This transformation, this reversal, is exactly what Jesus is getting at in his sermon on the planet. If you remember from last week, we heard Luke's version of the Beatitudes. We heard the invitation to transform our lives from woe to blessing. And in this portion of the sermon, Jesus is building upon that theme. As we've turned our lives once more back to God, we're now invited to see the world not as it is, but as it could be. We're invited to see relationships in new ways, to take cultural norms and live into them a way that is fit for the kingdom of God. So instead of hating our enemies and seeking retaliation, Jesus says, love your enemies. Not only does Jesus call us to love them, but he goes on to say, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. I wonder how many standing there did a double take at his words. I wonder how many heads were spinning as Jesus went on to say, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, Offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. In these head scratching directions, Jesus is not saying that we're called to be punching bags for the kingdom. To paraphrase St. Paul, we're called to be fools for Christ, not doormats. But Jesus is saying, is after having described the world for what it is and inviting people to see the way things could be, after naming the woeful state of the status quo and exalting the blessed state of living by the way, Jesus is fleshing out what being the blessed of God looks like. It means forgiveness, not retaliation. It means giving everything and living by the abundance of the kingdom of God and not the scarcity of the world. It means in all that we do, no matter the cost, we are called to live lives rooted in unconditional love, to live life modeled on that overflowing, abundant, incomprehensible love that takes God to the cross. In this sermon, 
Jesus is saying that this life of discipleship will require us to live by a higher standard than those who choose not to follow him. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Anybody can do that, Jesus says. We need to love more. By viewing the world through this new lens, old cycles of violence and retribution are broken. This new lens allows us to see relationships that are established not based on what a person can do for us, but on the foundation that all people are beloved children of God. By viewing the world through this new lens, we are set free from all that holds us captive, set free to live lives in that indescribable beauty of the realm of God, basking in all the luxury and reward of God's generosity. Several months ago, Lutheran pastor Nadia Bowles Weber posted a series of videos online about a variety of topics. For those of you not familiar with her work, she holds no punches when it comes to proclaiming the gospel. Here's what she has to say about forgiveness. Maybe retaliation or holding on to anger about the harm done to me doesn't actually combat evil. Maybe it feeds it. Because in the end, if we're not careful, we can actually absorb the worst of our enemy and at some level start to become them. So what if forgiveness, rather than being a way to say it's okay, is actually a way of wielding bolt cutters and snapping the chains that link us? What if it's saying what you did was so not okay that I refuse to be connected to it anymore? Forgiveness is about being a freedom fighter and free people are dangerous people. Free people aren't controlled by the past. Free people laugh more than others. Free people see beauty where others do not. Free people are not easily offended. Free people are unafraid to speak truth to stupid. Free people are not chained to resentment. That's worth fighting for. What Bulls Weber calls free people, Jesus calls blessed. And we've been created to be those free, those blessed people. To do that, we've got to realize that forgiveness is hard. But the feeling of liberation from those chains makes it absolutely worth it. Today, Jesus reminds us that the way of life we're called to is a difficult one. And it will require difficult, sometimes absolutely gut-wrenching work from us. But when we yield those bolt cutters, when we do that work, we become free. Blessed people we were meant to be. So let us seek that freedom together. Let us trust that God is always present with us, always working in and through us, especially in the pain and darkness. Let us give thanks that God is merciful, and gracious, and loving. Let's give thanks that with God, darkness and pain and death are not the final words. Most of all, let us rejoice that with God, final words are light and healing and abundant.